Welcome to chapter 13. We're going to cover meiosis and the related concept of asexual versus sexual reproduction. Uh, if you're talking about sexual reproduction, we're always going to talk about meiosis with mitosis. Uh, they'll kind of alternate. When we talk about asexual reproduction, that will oftentimes just be mitosis or binary fission if you happen to be a prokaryotic cell. Uh, so looking at this process, both of these life cycles, if you will, both of these ways of passing on your genetics, which we call heredity, uh, are going to allow your genes to make it into offspring into the next generation. But there are differences between the two. If you use an asexual route, you produce clones. So that means you pass on 100% of your genes to your offspring, which seems, on the face of it, really good, especially if you have really good genes. With sexual reproduction, it'll be about 50% because you're obviously going to pass on one set and then the other parent passes on the other set. And so it'll be a 50-50 amount that you get from each parent. So that means that half of your genes don't make it to the offspring. So that could be considered a drawback, if you will. Uh, the other idea is that asexual reproduction will typically be very good at speed because everybody can produce offspring and they don't have to go looking for a mate. Whereas with sexual reproduction, you have where only half the individuals, assuming that 50% are female, 50% are male, then about half the individuals could actually give birth, uh, the other half could not. And then you have where you have to find a mate, and so especially if you're somewhere where it's sparsely populated, that can be an issue, it can be time consuming, uh, it can involve a lot of energy expenditure if you're trying to like woo a mate. And so this tends to be slower, tends to be a bit more costly. So on the face of things, it seems like asexual is a much better way. But the only drawback that you'll see with asexual is that you produce a clone. And so that means that whatever issues that you have, you also pass on to all your offspring. And so it's kind of like bulk producing a specific lock, but they all use the same key. So if there's a pathogen, if there's something that's going after you, a parasite that figures out that key, it's able to access every single individual. You're all vulnerable. So how asexual organisms try to get some diversity to try and prevent one thing from wiping out all of them is they typically rely on mutations. But because they tend to reproduce very quickly, they end up having a fairly large amount of mutants, if you will, just because they have so many offspring. Even if a small number of them tend to have mu uh, mutations present, it still ends up being a pretty significant number. Now, if you're going to be a larger organism that reproduces more slowly in general, well, then now you have this problem where you reproduce too slowly for mutation to help you out dramatically. And so in this case, that's where sexual reproduction comes in. Because each time you reproduce, because you only take half from each parent, it's kind of like you're reshuffling the decks. And so, or in this case, you're rekeying the lock, if you want to use the lock analogy. And so that means that you can have offspring that have diversity that you don't. They have conditions that you don't. And that means they might be able to survive things that you can't. And so if there's a disease, if there's a parasite, it may be able to go after some of your offspring, but not all of them. And so even though you have fewer offspring, each offspring can be considered to be kind of like higher quality, perhaps, in terms of genetics than the others just because they have this mixture. They're not all vulnerable to the same things. It makes it harder for parasites and for pathogens to key in and go after your specific offspring. Now with the human life cycle, we're going to have a sexual life cycle. So this will be sexual. And what you'll see here is you the individual are going to be 2N. You're going to be diploid. And you got to be who you are by having this fertilized egg called a zygote go through a bunch of mitosis to make you, which is like 100 trillion cells all working together. But now some of your cells after you hit puberty will be 2N and they're going to go through this process of meiosis, which will produce what's called gametes. That's the only haploid phase that we have as humans. And so these guys will be 1N and their job is going to be, depending on which one you want to consider which, one of them is going to be a sperm, and one will typically be called an ovum. And so they're going to merge via fertilization to get back to that zygote. That zygote then does mitosis a whole bunch, gets back to an individual who then can go through puberty, produce its own gametes, meet up with somebody of the opposite gender with the opposite gamete, go through fertilization, and the process repeats. So for us, for most animals, you'll see that the 2N phase is going to be the dominant one. That's the one that you see when you're looking at an individual, you're looking at a diploid organism. Uh, 
when we look at the chromosomes, which is one of the ways we'll track a lot of these things, you'll see humans, when we look at our karyotype, which is a picture of the chromosomes taken at metaphase, they'll oftentimes stain the chromosomes, and then they'll take a picture while they're in this process because they're kind of lined up as neatly as possible in metaphase, and then they can then cut up the picture to separate out each of the chromosomes. So in the case of humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So you have one chromosome that you essentially got from mom, and you've got one chromosome that you essentially got from dad for each pair. And we organize them by size. So the chromosome number one is the biggest chromosome, and chromosome number 22 is the smallest. Now, you may ask what's going on with that 23rd pair. That's the sex chromosomes. So we call these first 22 pairs autosomes, and we call this last set these last couple on the end, we call those sex chromosomes because those largely determine the gender. Uh, so if we're looking at this, you'll see that we've got where XY would ultimately be male and XX would be female. So if you look at that last set of sex chromosomes, you can figure out the gender of the offspring. All offspring that are humans will still have these 22 pairs though. Now, if we were looking at this at metaphase, keep in mind that each of these single chromosomes would actually com be comprised of two chromatids that are identical copies. And so that's one of the things that it's not going to show here. We've kind of ignored that just to show one chromosome because this is the genetic info that would be in your normal somatic 2N body cells throughout most of your life outside of when they're dividing, outside of when you've replicated the DNA. You'll see that not only does size differentiate some of these guys when you're trying to figure out who's who, they also have different centromere positions. So these guys are all lined up at their centromere. So you can see sometimes the centromere can be very much towards one end. Sometimes the centromere is just about in the middle. And so by looking at the size and the centromere position, it makes it fairly possible to just kind of look through and set these karyotypes up without too much difficulty, which can allow us to see the chromosome number, which can help us uh, determine things like if there's genetic disorders. It can help us determine the species that we're looking at if we're not sure. And it can also help us figure out things like gender. So this is a human karyotype, but you could do this for other things as well. Now, alternative life cycles. I know some people might be thinking that this is people who live in odd ways, but that's not what we're talking about some organisms don't reproduce the same way that we do. We tend to have this situation where we have a multicellular diploid, and so that's what this two kind of represents, these, these sidebars here, because this is kind of our normal life cycle that everybody has to do. They go from 2N to 1N and back. Everybody that reproduces sexually uh, is going to go through this process, no matter what. But some individuals will have a multicellular structure, just like animals do, like us, and so you'll see that is only for the diploid. So we only have a multicellular diploid. So this would be like most animals. All right? But there are other ways of going about this. So the other simpler way, if you will, is one that's more of a fungal way, although some algae will do this as well. Uh, but this is largely going to be the fungal way. Here, let me just draw an arrow, seeing as I can draw for crap. And so you'll see that their multicellular stage is going to be a multicellular haploid stage. So they are only going to fuse their gametes to become 2N, and then they typically immediately or very quickly go through mitosis to make spores, is what typically is what's made. And those will be 1N cells that then grow into adult fungi. So if you look at a fungus, you'll see most of the fungus is actually underground, and it's these long, thin filaments, and those filaments are haploid. That's the body of the fungus, but it's haploid. So they have kind of the opposite of us, where we've got this larger diploid structure that is our body. They've got this larger haploid structure that is their body. And they will only have a brief diploid phase, just enough to go through meiosis and get back to being haploid, just enough to go through sexual reproduction. Whereas for us, we only have a haploid phase that's just enough to merge to go through sexual reproduction, but that's it. We don't have like sperm people that doesn't happen. Our sperms stay single-celled, just like they tend to produce spores, and the spores immediately grow into a haploid fungus, or as soon as they land in good conditions, grow into a haploid body structure of a fungus. They don't have where the 2N stage becomes multicellular, typically. Now, there is one other oddball, and this is predominant in plants. Uh, some algae does, but predominantly plants. And this is what we oftentimes call alternation of generation where plants can have where they have a multicellular 
haplo or multicellular diploid stage that we call sporophyte, and they'll also have a multicellular haploid phase, which we call gametophyte. And so if you see this, or these terms, gametophyte or sporophyte, they're just referring to those two multicellular parts of their life cycle. They don't kind of make either part of their life cycle quick. They would go through when they would do fusion or fertilization to get a 2N cell, a zygote. That would then undergo mitosis to produce some chunk of the plant. Now, in some cases, this is the predominant part of the plant. Uh, like trees, you're looking at a diploid structure, and they'll just have a small multicellular haploid structure that's in the flower. For some things like moss, the bulk of the moss that you're looking at is actually going to be haploid, uh, but there will sometimes be this diploid structure that grows up out of it, and so they're still going to have a multicellular phase for each. So that's different than fungus, which has no multicellular diploid phase, and that's different than humans, which have no multicellular haploid stage. Plants do it both ways. And so that's alternation of generation, and that's going to be the plants and such. So fertilization, get a zygote, do mitosis. At some point, that will undergo meiosis, which will produce spores, typically we'll call them. Those spores will develop into multi-celled structures that will ha be haploid, which will then go through mitosis to produce, uh, in this case, the gametes, the, the sperm, the, the ovum, or the egg, which will then go through fertilization, and we're back to where we started. So they're going to do mitosis on both sides of this, if you will, to make it multicellular. Uh, that's going to wrap up the first podcast, but the next one will be the bigger one where we kind of focus on meiosis and the steps of meiosis.